Good morning. So I just followed a great storyteller, and I know I'm in a room of storytellers, so I thought I would try to tell one of my own stories. Um, and this is a story that has sort of all the classic elements of a story. There's the protagonists and the heroes, and there's the antagonists and the villains, and there's some plot twists, and there's some themes. And actually, I think we hope there will even be a happy ending. And given that we're actually in here in Dent, um, I've actually thrown in a little alchemy as well. So let's start with the villain. And this is a very cunning, and in this instance, female um, villain that is actually has been deemed by the economists and others to be probably the most uh, vicious organism in the history of the world. That over a million people die regularly based on some bite they get from a mosquito. And actually, over the history of humanity, this particular um, organism has been uh, hurting us and creating an immense amount of human suffering. It's a nuisance, it's deadly, it's actually uh, prolific, and actually mosquitoes are extremely complicated. And one of the many diseases, and the biggest disease that mosquitoes cause is malaria. And malaria is probably the single most, uh, you know, uh, uh, in the history of the world, is it, some th people think more people have died of malaria than on any other single disease, although that's not clear. But we do know that all the way back in, uh, in uh, uh, 2700 BC, the Chinese were writing about malaria. And um, back in 1700 BC, the Sumerians were describing this. Actually, the word malaria comes from an Italian letter written in 1790 where they describe mal air or bad air because they assumed this came from the air that came out of the swamps and the rivers. And one interesting little tidbit about malaria is the Center for Disease Control, the US Public Health Agency, is actually based in Atlanta, not DC, where many, many, most agencies are. And the reason why it was put there to look to address the malaria epidemic in the US South right after World War I. So um, why am I talking about malaria here in the beautiful mountains of Idaho? where we don't even think about malaria. And actually, we've eliminated malaria in this country back in the 50s. So it's not something that is part of our daily lives. It is because malaria remains the number three killer of kids in the world. And, and the bad news is that in this story is that over half of the uh, world, about 3.3 billion people in 97 countries are still at risk of being infected every day. It's also a disease that represents enormous amount of inequi the inequity in the world. In fact, there's a certain sort of morality play it, at work in this story. Because in fact, malaria is not a disease your kids or mine or hardly any rich or middle class kids in the world um, die from. It is absolutely emerged as a disease of poverty. It's in, in the most impoverished places. There's not many people who, um, there are not many market forces that work to support the elimination of malaria. And actually, not only is it a disease of poverty, but malaria actually contributes greatly to poverty. It is thought in Africa that the number one reason kids don't go to school is actually malaria. And uh, there is um, about, uh, estimated about a $12 billion loss of productivity every year on the African continent due to malaria. But actually, this is a tale of two cities, or two worlds. A world where we have malaria, and a world where we don't have malaria. And the good news about the story is we're beginning to make great progress. In fact, we live in an era, and I would say in the last 20 years, where we're making immense progress against a wide variety of diseases and health conditions, which in fact are, are, are really at the root of inequity in this world. In fact, my organization, PATH, is really the leader in global health innovation, and we work across five core platforms of innovation, a lot of work on vaccines, on drugs, on devices, on diagnostics, and, uh, and a lot of work on system and service innovation. And we have joined hands with many, many others around the world to really support the efforts of, of driving down these diseases in, in which, um, which affect uh, so many and so unfairly. And in the epic, and back to malaria, in the epic battle 
over the, you know, several millennia now against this disease, we really are at a really interesting point in the storyline where we actually believe that with the right amount of commitment, innovation, and, 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 um, and, and sheer will and work, that we can eliminate this disease in our lifetime. So that's the great part of the story. And I wanna now describe a little bit of how the story is unfolding. So just to give you a historical perspective, in 1945, this is what the world looked like. Almost every country in the world had malaria. And, um, and, and you can see, except for the most cold or high places in the world. By 1990, really this became a disease through a variety of interventions, particularly high levels of spraying uh, and insecticide control and others. We have seen um, it really became a phenomena of the southern hemisphere. And, um, and we um, and continue to drive um, different uh, approaches to eliminating malaria. And then by uh, 2015, it is even further reduced. So we can see um, just a very, uh, while a large number of countries, it's a fairly concentrated area in the globe where we still have to worry about this disease. And while um, there, there is uh, you know, a lot of progress, the challenge of getting to these last countries in these last cases, this last mile of this work is gonna be the hardest. And so you know, what I'd like to talk a little bit about now is how we're gonna go about doing that. First of all, the most important thing in this story is to know the protagonists or the heroes are not people in, from Seattle or Washington or London or Sun Valley. This is a story being written primarily by leaders, of political and scientific leaders of the, of, in Africa and in Asia. This is truly uh, an agenda of these countries to uh, take on this disease and with our support and help but, but um, want to make sure that um, it's understood that this is not us doing anything to them. This is actually us working on, uh, together on this incredible project. And we're seeing some really interesting accomplishments. Now, in the, yesterday, someone mentioned the Millennium Development Goals, the commitments the United Nations made in 2000 over the next 15 years, and we saw about 10 countries in Africa hit their goals around malaria elimination. We have seen others making deep commitments to an elimination strategy, in fact, the regionals of Southern Africa in, by 2020. And we are actually, what's interesting is starting to see more and more domestic financing of African governments themselves being able to now make um, more commitment to this fight. And so, um, you know, this is the, the landscape against which we're assisting in sort of how do we get from here to a world where that map in 2030 has no red on it. And that's what I want to discuss as it relates to dent. Because in fact, what we need to do over the next 10 to 15 years is work a lot on new innovations and new design issues that really will get us from here to the elimination of malaria. And these come at all levels and in all forms, design around products, design around systems, design around financing, design around operational management and logistics. And in fact, um, uh, you know, the, the, the view is, is that unless we get some of these right, we're not gonna be able to push through um, to the next level. The other thing about this design is this is all done with enormous constraints. So first of all, malaria and the work that we do is by almost definition not being solved by the private sector. These are conditions where markets are failing today or have failed. Um, and governments have failed in, 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 in full part to, to be able to manage some of this. So these require a very complex set of collaborations with public, private, and social sector and civil society to come together to solve these problems. We're also working in areas where cost and affordability are absolutely critical. And unlike a lot of technology innovation, at least in my lifetime, where you, know, where you don't think about cost until the very end and you can figure out what the, the unit cost is after you've committed the R&D, we have to start in every one of these designs saying, what's the price at the end of the day of this design or this tool? What's the cog? And we design toward that price. And so we're thinking constantly about affordability and accessibility and cultural relevancy for everything we do. And then the third constraint is in, in, inevitably we are working in some of in the most endemic areas for malaria in really harsh conditions. 
places there's very little infrastructure in many instances, where there's lacking of, of uh, facilities or institutional capabilities, where we don't have uh, proper education systems to do the um, dissemination of, 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 of um, you know, best practices and things like that. So, um, you know, they're, they're, this work comes with enormous constraints. But actually, I would say our, our teams and actually many of our partners, we actually don't think of these as constraints, but really more as the opportunities and design challenges in order to make the impossible possible. So let me take uh, you through very quickly some of these innovations that are on the horizon that we need your help in helping us think through. So um, like most of these disease areas, and probably I would say most large uh, social problems in uh, the, the global faces, there are no magic bullets. So this is not a, oh, if we could only create that one app or that one issue or that. This is a very complicated toolkit of different uh, tool devices. We have different types of mosquitoes, different types of malaria, different uh, social or uh, political conditions. So we've got to work across a wide range. Um, and I'll let me name you a few. So in vaccines, uh, there's probably no uh, model that shows us to a full eradication of malaria without an effective vaccine. Now, proudly, PATH and working with our partner GlaxoSmithKline recently um, saw the first ever vaccine, our project so it was the first ever malaria vaccine actually registered um, by a stringent regulatory authority last year, which is a huge milestone in global health. Um, we'll see it is only partially effective, so we still have to see how the uptake will work in a very complicated environment. But it's actually a huge scientific milestone. There are a lot of drug, um, drugs that are at work in a malaria environment or in most health environments. The challenge is often they're too toxic for long-term use. They're too complicated for a regime, so we need to get it more simple where people can just take one drug rather than many. Um, and there's a lot of interesting um, challenges in the drug world, uh, resistance and other kinds of things that are emerging. So one of the interesting examples around malaria that we worked on was uh, the main anti-malarial medicine is called artemisinin. Actually, the recent Nobel Prize in science went to a Chinese doctor for her discovery of that. Um, but it's made out of a natural wood product. The problem with that is that it creates a bunch of uh, erratic um, uh, market dynamics. So its supply and demand goes up and down. The price goes up and down. Stockouts around the world go up and down. And so, to, so our, we, working with scientists in, in the Bay Area and biotech and, and Berkeley, we've actually worked on a, a, a semi-synthetic artemisinin, and a synthetic version, which we've now put into a reservoir to stabilize the pricing and supply. So it will actually help us keep sure that people get this kind of um, access. We also see diagnostics as a critical piece that we are actually, I've been in too many clinics around the world or, or homes where a baby is dying or dies and we actually learn later maybe that they died of an infection when they had a fever, but we were treating them with malaria drugs because we thought it was malaria. So we've got to get better at how do we quickly diagnose, cheaply diagnose what the problem is so we can cure it. And the good news there is there's a huge amount of work that's being done uh, and with remote tools and digital tools, we can do more um, remotely and, and more effectively. And of course, the whole range of insecticides and bed nets and clothes and, and bed liners is, 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 is on the horizon, as well as some really interesting new stuff. We heard yesterday the conversation about genetics, uh, 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 some genetic modeling to uh, uh, sterilize mosquitoes effectively. And there's some pretty exciting new stuff on the horizon. The challenge there is affordability and acceptability is pretty far out still um, in terms of when would it be registered and get to a price point that could be really used at scale. So scale's really important. So I teach at Stanford and I teach a class on taking social innovation to scale. And one of the things we've learned the hard way is that if you don't, uh, you can do a lot of cool things with a lot of interesting products or applications. Um, but if we can't figure out how they work in the health system, how do we get them to be used and uh, uh, the uptake working and regulated and managed, then they're not really worth anything. So we also need a lot of thinking and innovation around um, system innovation. Now you can imagine in the parts of Africa and Asia where I'm talking about, the systems, the health systems that we work in are incredibly complicated. 
years of colonial rule layered on top of years of multiple aid and development agencies putting in their processes, and now local governments and national governments. It is a very uh, burdensome, complex environment in which, uh, you know, uh, and, and often with very, very little infrastructure or very, very few resources. This is just an example um, of, a, you know, a system of, uh, in a Kenya, uh, county in Kenya of how do we see health supplies being approved and disapproved with the number of players and the number of actors. And so one of our jobs or one of the things we strive to do is work with local governments or national governments or multilaterals to say how can you simplify, how can we make more elegant these systems so we actually are not struggling so hard to get um, to get um, products or services, or um, sometimes it's patient care complexity, or sometimes it's uh, logistics and supplies, sometimes it's financing flows. It's, it's a, each of these come with their own constraints. Um, I'm not gonna talk about this chart, but I'm gonna talk about um, a really interesting innovation in the area of system and design. Um, so let me take you back to Africa. Now this is the country of Zambia, a country which is committed to malaria elimination, a country in which our, our, my organization, PATH, is working deeply with the Ministry of Health to um, enable a malaria elimination strategy. Um, and uh, it's also, let me take you the one step further and remind you uh, just a little bit more about the, um, about the epidemiological um, nature of malaria. So malaria is um, a parasite, uh, multiple varieties. Um, a female mosquito bites somebody uh, they, um, at night. It's a nighttime mosquito. Um, and um, and the, the reality is only about 20% of people who actually have the malaria parasite um, end up being sick. And so the challenge we have is there's an enormous reservoir or 80% of people holding this malaria parasite are actually completely healthy. So um, the challenge then becomes, is you can imagine a mosquito bites a healthy person who has a parasite and goes and bites another person and gives them even though the person was healthy. So this is, this is a problem in managing toward an elimination strategy. That's why we keep trying to go after the mosquito as opposed to necessarily more and more treating people. But what we've been working with governments and designers to say, well, we need to go after the reservoir too. And we need to be smarter. The traditional model of just treating symptomatic people isn't going to be enough. So in Zambia, these are all health centers. So these are community health centers where um, we work with uh, about uh, 12,000 health workers and are over about 200 clinics. Now, now these clinics are frontline. They're usually a shack. There's no trained doctors or nurses. These are actually very much about you know, po health posts in the middle of nowhere where people come and get their major training um, so, or their, their basic services. But what we've done is started, um, whoops, going the wrong direction. Um, what we've started thinking about is how do you actually understand the dynamics of the mosquito and this epidemic in the local villages, in places that are off the grid, that there's no housing addresses. So using Android uh, t tools, using a Google Map a platform, we've created an application where we actually are tracking basically the index cases. We understand when somebody comes in, they treat are treated symptomatic, and then create a model, which about 100 meters right now around it, which then every household in that model gets tested and treated. And we can then start tracking where these infections are occurring, where the reservoir, given the distance mosquitoes fly and some other epidemiological data, where the reservoirs um, may occur. And in fact, we're doing some work on actually ensuring that everybody in these catchment areas um, gets actually treated. So then we're really the fundamental idea is knowing uh, with a bunch of new data models, knowing where the re reservoir is, where the mosquitoes are, and treating as many people with antimalarials can we go after the reservoir. And that's really um, the, the idea here, is to clear the human reservoir of mosquitoes. Then what we're also doing is taking it one step further. And one of the challenges in a lot of these um, environments is that, uh, is the first picture of me in that uh, health clinic showed, is most of this material is still manually logged. And, and the record keeping for this work is often just manual that goes translates up to just a report to a government. So working with a number of uh, partners, in, in this instance, the Tableau, the um, digital 
um, uh, analytics and visualization software company, we've actually um, partnered to enable the government at various levels to understand better what's really going on, where we are seeing malaria, where hot spots are occurring, where transmission might be coming from. So we can actually not only get ahead of this, but also give data and information back to the health workers who are um, actually in the front line. You know, the, that, and that gets me to one of the things I want to underscore here is, while we can talk about cool data tools and new vaccines and new drugs, and they are, in fact, an amazing set of supporting actors in this, in this story, the real heroes are these guys. The, in, in Africa and Asia, we have a whole world of community health workers who actually are usually not paid, they are um, working every day doing arduous work, going out to, uh, hiking 12, 15 miles a day into villages, um, trying to bring treatments and trust and diagnostics and others to these, um, uh, to these communities. And I have to say, in the work I do around the world, I, these are truly my heroes because um, not only are they providing the actual frontline effort with all the tools, but they also, um, you know, they're the, vo they're the customers we're listening to. What do you need? What are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? How can we help you the most? So um, it's with great humility that I have the privilege of, of working with them. So we've got some tools, we've got some system issues to work on, but you know, like in all things, how the heck are we gonna pay for all of this? And, um, and uh, you know, the, the funding for malaria or for global health is a, is a, is, is a constant challenge. Um, now, we've actually had some good years with a lot of global commitments, um, and they're from a number of traditional types of global aid and development donors, as well as new private sector players um, and new foundations. Um, but almost every projection would say there will be a significant drop in the future for a variety of economic reasons. So we're actually challenged, in addition to the scientific and system issues, to say, how are we going to even be innovative in our approach to financing? So let me give you um, a couple. Uh, of examples. Um, one that's already underway is a commitment made about 12 years ago by the global community coming out of a meeting in Davos where we put together a, um, a fund mechanism which aggregates demand and uh, resources from around the world to create a fund that is, uh, enables uh, about $4 billion a year to flow to countries, uh, to consortia uh, around AIDS, uh, malaria, and TB control in various countries. And it's been seen as, as wildly um, successful, in fact, actually as a sort of a, a model for future kind of uh, multilateral um, structures for um, financing, uh, new kinds of financing. Um, and there's a lot more to that story, but I think this next one is particularly interesting, and this is a work in progress. This is not done yet, but is um, in a country like Zambia, where they, there is still, while their economic indicators are growing, there's still a gap between what they can afford to do from their domestic budget and what it's gonna take to eliminate. And what we don't want to do is allow their domestic budget to, I mean, we want, there would be a tragedy to not have elimination happen because there was volatility in their own market, particularly given that they are highly commodity price driven. Their 60% of their national income comes from copper and copper um, has uh, not, the price of copper has been way down. So we're actually exploring a mechanism against which we would sort of hedge on the price of copper and um, say, look, if your copper price, the, US, the uh, um, institutional and overseas investors to this trust would ensure that we will cover the cost of elimination, so, you know, what, the gap between what you can fund and elimination. But if price, if, if copper prices go up over the next X years, we will, um, you, you know, you have to kick in an incremental uh, greater portion. So we're ensuring that there's some correlation between um, sort of local uh, financing mechanisms and the need. And then finally, when I was, I ran global social innovation at McKinsey for a few years, and we did a lot of work on the, what we heard about yesterday, social impact bonds, um, uh, 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 helped design some of the early development bonds, malaria bonds. So there's a whole bunch of new potential investment mechanisms that have incentives for investors as well as um, countries to support this. And so I'm, I'm quite excited about that. So um, if all this comes together, <laughs> We have a pretty cool ending to this story. It, it couldn't be um, a, a better uh, storybook ending, and I think it's possible. We don't have the roadmap entirely clear, and there's still lots of ifs, ands, and buts, but um, there is a coalition around the world that's coming together to make this happen. 
And so I hope you appreciate the story and see why I'm so excited and optimistic um, and really uh, think that we are um, on the verge of being able to do something that's quite amazing in human history, which is to say we can come together and actually eliminate diseases. We've not done that many times. We've done it in smallpox, uh, which we did in 1979. We're actually on the verge of eradicating polio. We have a few more cases of indigenous polio in Pakistan, and, but we have seen extraordinary progress there. Um, but it's uh, a great time in human history um, to write more of these stories and to be part of a larger movement to ensure really the sustainable development of all people. Now, I say this as someone who's spent my life working in uh, social innovation and change. Um, I also say this, however, as somebody who's uh, a pretty pragmatic and a pretty um, uh, uh, looks at to the evidence. And so I want to um, make sure you understand that this isn't just a naive hope. But there are four really critical trends that you should take away to understand why this is so possible now in our lifetime. The first is we have an enormous amount of momentum on our side. As I said, we have, for a variety of reasons that we can go under the graph, but you know, there, there are lots, there's enormous amount of momentum on, on, on tackling morbidity and mortality of children and women um, in the world, and we are on a roll. And we have seen enormous investments, we've seen political alignment, but we've also seen the cycle, the virtuous cycle start to happen, which is if you have healthier families who have fewer diseases to work with, actually healthier, particularly healthier moms, end up creating healthier families, healthier communities. So we're seeing the virtuous cycle start kicking in and lower family sizes come with um, increased health in almost any instance. So um, the momentum is very much on our side. The second is we do have this extraordinary phenomena of political and financial commitment at the global level. We talked about the sustainable development goals that were um, uh, unanimously passed by the United Nations member states last September, but in, with that have come other kinds of financial commitments, new players, and, um, and a lot of corresponding uh, work on R&D, uh, uh, aligning our R&D efforts in these areas, our programmatic efforts, and our advocacy efforts. So we've got um, politics on our side. We also have an, a, a very fun, huge sea change in global demographics that is actually a, been a part of the story. Um, as we have thought so much about the pyramid representing the global socio-demographics, but actually it's morphing with enormous amount of people moving up into a lower middle class category. Um, not to dismiss there are still deep pockets of inequity and poverty, but that actually provides huge amount of opportunity. First, it means that um, we will see um, uh, more, um, uh, few, more, people, uh, more poor people in the world. In fact, today, the poorest people in the world live in middle-income countries, so different solutions are being put to work. The second is, as you see more and more people become sort of lower middle-income consumers, um, um, entrepreneurs and companies of all sizes are now incented to join the fight. So we're actually seeing an enormous amount of private sector engagement at a level we've not seen before, in part due to this phenomena. And finally, I think the, this, this is really indicative of a world in which innovation is no longer the global north and the high income guys giving to the base of the pyramid. But in fact, we're actually thinking of the network of innovation around the world, and this supports that idea. And finally, I can't, you can't think about this work without understanding the impactful nature of disruptive technologies. Certainly digital tools to enable us to understand, track, trace, remotely treat a phenomena, genetics and genetic testing, social media used to mobilize communities around demand creation, all of these are critical factors in giving us confidence. So as I said at the beginning, <laughs> This story should end up to be a pretty good one at the end. But the challenge is it's not fully written yet. And we need um, the global community to work with us to write the end of that story. And so I would leave with you asking you this, the Dent community, to do two things. Uh, one is to think about how you can help with this story or with this um, potentially historically, um, um, uh, this historic phenomena. 
And to remind you, it doesn't just, you know, you don't have to be a lab scientist. As you saw through a lot of these slides, there's um, a whole bunch of different components to this, this journey, and we need um, the help of everyone. The other thing I think uh, it should leave you with is the, um, this, this constant sense that we of optimism, despite the tragedy today and the tragedies we live with around the world. There is a lot of optimism and hope that we can actually still um, do what we thought was impossible for several millennia to actually make that possible today. So I would urge you to um, join us in writing the end of this or possibly other stories of human achievement and innovation. Thank you. Thank you.